Broadcasting live from the Newsmax studio in New York City, here is Steve Malzberg. The American combat mission in Iraq has ended. Operation Iraqi Freedom is over. At the same desk where his predecessor announced the beginning, President Barack Obama declared an end to U.S. combat operations in Iraq. Earlier, the president met with soldiers at Fort Bliss, Texas, a base which lost 51 soldiers in Iraq. Mr. Obama told the troops responsibility now lies with the Iraqi people, a point he reiterated later. In the end, only Iraqis can resolve their differences and police their streets. And that was uh, Barack Obama back in 2011. Joining us now is uh, Ali Kaderi, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of the Dubai-based uh, Dragoman Partners. He's also the longest continually serving official in Iraq, where he acted as a special assistant to five U.S. ambassadors and as a senior advisor to three heads of U.S. Central Command. Ali, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you for having me. Well, it's my pleasure. Okay, you wrote a piece for the Washington Post um, talking about uh, why we stuck uh, with uh, the man we stuck with, uh, uh, Maliki, and uh, why we lost uh, Iraq. Why did we stick with him? It's a great question. Uh, one, frankly, that should be directed to the White House. But at the time, um, Vice President Biden and others who were in charge of Iraq policy felt that Maliki was the, a, a, a reliable partner for the United States in Iraq and one who would uh, fend off the Iranians and one who would allow U.S. troops to remain in Iraq past 2011. Unfortunately, it seems that those uh, judgments have proven to be incorrect. Well, yeah, that, that, that's pretty obvious. Now, do you, I mean, it, 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 do you, you see this as the central uh, reason for where we are today in Iraq, I presume. What about the, you know, the, the ancillary uh, issues such as Syria and such as Mideast policy overall. And uh, I mean, uh, do you believe that and not reaching a you know, sofa with uh, with Iraq, uh, which many uh, blame Obama for by you know, for insisting that uh, that he go through that that uh, Maliki go through uh, the parliament, which was uh, basically unprecedented in demanding uh, what the procedure would be for a, an agreement on a sofa. Um, how much do you blame Obama? Uh, for those other things as well as sticking with uh, Maliki? Well, I think you raise an excellent point, which is the fact that in the Middle East uh, today, as has always been the case, all of the issues are interconnected and interrelated. And so what happens in Iraq affects what happens in Iran, affects what happens in Syria, in Lebanon, in the Gulf countries, etc. And um, I think, frankly, the United States failure in addressing some of these uh, existential problems that are uh, in Syria, for example, the Syrian civil war, uh, the turbulence in Iraq, I think that failure of leadership and that vacuum uh, has contributed to the situation that we're seeing now in Iraq. And frankly, the fact that we continue, that the White House continues to lobby Congress to expedite F-16 Apache attack helicopter and Hellfire missile sales for Maliki's government, despite the fact that there are very clear indications that Maliki's government is complicit in aiding Assad in committing genocide in Syria, that only will further contribute to the instability uh, across the Middle East and only harm American national security interests because there because this genocide in Syria and Maliki's campaign of ethnic cleansing across Iraq will only help al-Qaeda and ISIS in their recruitment campaigns, which means it will only uh, assist in, in more fighters potentially plotting another 9-11 against the United States. What, Ali, what, what makes this administration think that, uh, that uh, the Iraqi army, uh, or whatever you want to call it, uh, would, would be uh, qualified to fly those planes, keep those planes, or helicopters, or, or sophisticated equipment, when we've already seen them abandon the American equipment we've sent them, and many of those uh, the tanks and equipment are now, in, in, as you alluded to, in Syria? It, it's a great question, and again, I frankly refer you to the White House for the for response. <laughs> now, you know, it's I, funny, though, I keep calling up President Obama, and he doesn't return my calls. <laughs> I mean, I just, if I can share with your viewers, when I uh, was advising Ambassador Crocker and General Petraeus during the surge, at the end of the surge, the United States government donated 5,000 Humvees to Iraq at a cost of about $2.5 billion. 
Uh, many of those, hundreds of those potentially, of those Humvees, armored Humvees, are now in ISIS's hands being used in Syria um, by Al-Qaeda elements. It's a disaster, and that's why we cannot allow F-16s and Apaches and thousands of missiles uh, in the hands of a government that is aligned with Iran and with Assad. Uh, several people, uh, uh, Ralph Peters, uh, General Michael Hayden, uh, they, they, they've told us, uh, they've told me that uh, Iraq is gone. Uh, the Iraq we, we, we know or knew is, is not coming back. And um, what do you think of, uh, I, I mean, uh, do you see a future where there's a, a Sunnistan and a, and a Shiistan and a Kurdistan? Unfortunately, I, I agree with General Hayden and others that Iraq, as we have known it, uh, is almost certainly dead. I, uh, since 2003, since the start of the war, I, I helped advise um, on the formation of five Iraqi governments during that time and what the U.S. position should be. And it's my experience, based on knowing the Iraqi leaders personally, that there is no going back after what we've seen over the past several years, after Prime Minister Maliki's uh, gross negligence in handling state affairs and purging all of his political enemies. The leaders at this point don't want to work with each other. They don't want to live with each other. And so uh, I agree with the assessments of some of your other guests that, that it is almost certainly the case that Iraq is likely to fragment along ethno-sectarian lines, that you'll have a Shiistan in the south, a Sunnistan in the center, and a Kurdistan in the north. And one, I think one, I'm sorry, we got less than a minute, so I just want to ask you real quick, what about a caliphate? What about uh, this ISIS caliphate that uh, they want to form? They've declared a, a state, as a matter of fact, already. Um, I, I, is that going to be a reality? I think, frankly, that's almost a non-event. It's more of a public relations coup by these uh, radicals. I think what's really very little understood right now in the West is the fact that out of the five or six million Sunni Arab Iraqis fighting Prime Minister Maliki's government, only about five to 10 percent of those fighters are ISIS. About another 20 percent are hardcore Ba'athists, former regime elements of Saddam Hussein, and the other 60 or 70 percent are just normal day-to-day -day people, Sunni tribal members who are tired of being oppressed by Prime Minister Maliki's government and his, and his Iranian backers. They don't have any jobs. They haven't had jobs for years. They don't have electricity. They don't have water. And they're tired of being oppressed by this government in Baghdad. All right. Not a pretty picture, but uh, thank you for uh, sharing with us. And I'm sure we'll speak to you again. Ali Kaderi, uh, nice to talk to you, sir. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. All right, folks. Uh, very complicated situation. And again, something that's been placed on the, ba on the back burner right now. Uh, because of what's happening between Israel and Hamas, what's happening on the border, you name it. Uh, the scandals seem to rotate. The, uh, the priority of the story seem to rotate. But we'll keep you abreast of them all.